Hello again, this is Alan Murphy from uh, New Barn Christian Fellowship, uh, carrying on in our Hebrew word studies. And it's our last study uh, today in Numbers 13. We've been in Numbers 13 for three or four weeks now. Um, I said at the beginning when we started Numbers 13 how I felt it was such a significant passage, not only for God's people, the Israelites, uh, but also for our lives too. It's a pivotal, uh, a pivotal uh, passage because it um, involves a decision uh, which determines their futures. And I was trying to uh, say really and bring out the fact that the decisions we make uh, are so important uh, for our futures and our, our destiny. Um, and that's why we, uh, a number of weeks ago, we talked about the power of choice. So Numbers 13 is a very significant passage and it's blessed me as I've been looking at it. And um, <laughs> it was amazing, uh, just two or three days ago, I was reading a book and the book was called Seeing Things, which I felt was quite uh, applicable to what we've been looking at because Numbers 13 is all about what you see and how you see it. And particularly as we've been looking at Numbers 13, the first uh, line of the first chapter uh, of the first page said, on a dull day in the early 1990s, I took the number 13 bus. Now that might not mean anything to you, but when you've been looking at a passage of scripture for four or five weeks, and it's called Numbers 13, and then you read uh, a line of a book which says Number 13, uh, I felt that was God emphasising the significance of what we were looking at. And so I would encourage you really just to perhaps go over the, the talks once again, and just try and um, ask the Holy Spirit to uh, make the word become flesh in your own experience so you can carry out some actions that we need to be doing in our lives as a response and as a result. So um, we're going to look at this uh, passage today uh, in Numbers 13. Um, we haven't been reading the passage, but we've just been referring to certain Hebrew words. And the Hebrew word, the first word I wanted to look at, uh, is in verse 26 of Numbers 13 and verse uh, 26. And it says, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. So I want to look uh, today, or partly our study, uh, this place called Kadesh, because it's um, a really, really important place to be, not just for them, but there is a spiritual place of Kadesh, uh, which we come across in our lives, but I'm not sure we always realise the significance of this place. Now, Kadesh is mentioned numerous times in the Old Testament uh, and just a few cross references to help us. In Genesis 14, verse 7, we read about a battle in Kadesh. In uh, Numbers 20, we read about another battle, but it's not a battle with weapons. It's a battle between Moses and his people. This constant battle that he had. Uh, with his endeavouring to carry out obedience to God and their continued murmuring and groaning. So that was another battle. So we can say that Kadesh is a place of battle. Now, these battles are not always won. Uh, sometimes they end in victory and sometimes they can end in defeat. But that's not the end of the story. Just because a loser bat we lose a battle it doesn't mean to say we've lost the war. And we know that Jesus has already won the war. Um, but between now and when we actually see him face to face, there are numerous um, battles that we have to fight. 
And I don't know whether you remember, there was a song I used to sing in Sunday school years and years ago. And it was about the 12 spies. They were sent to spy in Canaan. And I'm going to try and remember the words and I'm going to try and do the actions. Uh, and if you're listening to this and you're a Sunday school teacher, then feel free to copy it. Um, but the words go something like this. Uh, and I'm going to say do the actions. And it's um, 12 spies were sent to spy in Canaan. 10 were bad. Two were good. What did they see to spy in Canaan? Ten were bad. Two were good. Some saw the giants tough and tall. Some saw the grapes in clusters fall. Some saw that God was in it all. Ten were bad. Two were good. OK, well, I can uh, if I could hear you, uh, I'm sure you're uh, applauding that. But anyway, let's move on. So Kadesh, I want to show you the word. I've been writing uh, the words uh, in the transliterated form. It's Kadesh. So that's K-A-D-E-S-H, Kadesh. And um, OK, and, and it means to be set apart or to be holy to be set apart uh, or to be holy and i'll explain why i've put the a and the e uh, in small letters in a moment now it's interesting and it's important for us to see that when god says be holy for i am holy he doesn't mean for us to be perfect. He means for us to be set apart. And there's another reference uh, you can look up. And uh, it's in it's in Leviticus, uh, Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 44. And in this verse, it says, be holy for I am holy. And yet it goes on to say, do not make yourselves unclean. So if we were able to be perfect, there would be no sense of then us in the same verse being able to be unclean. So we are unclean. We are still sinners. We still need the blood of Jesus to plead for us. But there is a sense in which God can set us and does set us apart. And that is Kadesh. OK, now the reason that I've put the large letters in, the K, the D, and the SH, we would call that the root of the word. And in Hebrew, uh, most if not all words have got a three letter uh, root. I mean, that's uh, one letter in the Hebrew, the Shin, but that's the root of the word. And I've probably mentioned before, that there are no vowels uh, in in Hebrew, uh, so we put the vowels in to make up the word. There are dots and dashes, right? Now, so that word kadesh means to be set apart. Now I'm going to write another word underneath, another word underneath, and it's k e. And you can be writing this down if you're making notes. K-E-D-E-S-H-A. OK. That's Kedesha. Kedesha. Now, I hope you can see that the K and the D and the SH is the same root as the K and the D and the SH up there. This means to be set apart. And when we're talking about us being set apart for God, it means that we're set apart to serve him. Um, we've been called out, uh, Ecclesia, the church, in order for us to be put back in the world. But this, this other word, Kedesha, means to be set apart as a prostitute. Now that reference is in Deuteronomy chapter 23, and verse 17. 
And if you look at the Hebrew word, it is Kedesha. Now, I want to explain why I'm saying that. The reason I'm saying that is because these two words have the same root, but a different outcome. One is being separate unto God, and the other one is being separate for another task, and in this case, prostitution. So the principle there is that you can have the same root as explained and as shown in the Hebrew word, but a different outcome. And it's really important that you grasp that. Dif same root, different outcome. And when we look at the spies, we see that they had the same root, different outcome. Um, and so there is a sense in, in, in which we've got to understand that I was I was thinking the other day uh, about people who've got the same root, like brothers, sisters, people in the family, same root, but different outcome. And I don't know why, but I was I was thinking about Alan Titchmarsh. And we've all seen probably Alan Titchmarsh on his programs, Ground Force, etc., and, and I thought, OK, well, he's famous and, and he is um, regarded as a, a gardener, a broadcaster, a, a poet, an author, a singer. I didn't know he could sing. <laughs> and he's even got a waxworks model in uh, Madame Tussauds. And yet he's got two brothers. And for the life of me, I couldn't find out what his brothers did for a job or if they're retired. Um, but can you see that that they came from the same family, but totally different outcome? Two of them are anonymous, didn't even know he had two brothers. But Alan himself has gone on to become famous and etc, and etc. Cetera, et cetera. Can you see same root, but different outcome? Now, we have all had the same uh, upbringing in 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 some senses i mean they're different but they're the same um, and we looked at that a few weeks ago didn't we the unity of opposites so there's a similarity you know there are parents and we might have siblings and all that sort of thing uh, but there is a difference in our upbringing <clears throat> and with our root our spiritual root we're all rooted in adam so we've all come from the same root we're all sinners, the Bible tells us. But you see, where we, we have looked at already about the power of choice is so much power there is and so much uh, importance needs to be placed on the things that we choose to do, the decisions we make. And it's those decisions which determine our outcome. So we can have the same route as someone else but we can have an amazingly different outcome. And that was the experience of Joshua and Caleb with the spies. They spied the land. <coughs> they all saw the same thing. <coughs> they saw uh, the grapes and, and all the fruit and, and all that sort of thing. They came through exactly the same thing but there was a different outcome. And I know, I know what side I would sooner be on. I'd sooner be on the side that's going to, that's going to look at things in a different way, uh, as Joshua and Caleb did. So if you can try and grasp that, you see, it's not about our upbringing. It's not about what our parents were like, what school we went to, what education we had and, and all this sort of thing. We can always make excuses for who we are and the way we are and the choices we make. We can make excuses. But the fact is that in Jesus Christ, you have the potential, you have the ability to be like Joshua and Caleb and to see what everyone else sees but have a different outcome 
So you just think about that, you pause on that, because that is a really important, powerful spiritual truth. Now in verse 30 of our passage, verse 30, uh, Numbers 13 and verse 30, then Caleb silenced the people before Moses because they'd been uh, giving a bad report uh, and said, we should go up <clears throat> and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. And if you read the passage, you'll know how different that attitude was of those two to the other ten. And it's really important in your Christian life that you don't have the same attitude as the majority. And there are times when God calls you and me to see things differently to act differently and to speak differently. Now, I'm going to show you this word, which is a word which means uh, we can certainly do it. Now, that word is yakol. That's the word there. Y-A-K-O-W-L. Yakol. And there's two meanings. One means to overcome and one means to suffer. One is to overcome and one is to suffer. And the thing that we've already said is that they saw the same thing. I believe that, that Joshua and Caleb, although they said, uh, gave a good report, in their humanity, I believe they were scared. I mean, Joshua 1, chapter 1, uh, God says, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. So he knows what we're like and he knows that Joshua and Caleb inside were probably thinking, yeah, they are big, aren't they? They are, oh, you know, we feel overwhelmed, etc., etc., And we've covered that. The important spiritual principle is it's not what we see, like what they saw in the land. It's not what we feel. It's not what others say. It's not what others see. It's what we say. So not what we see, not what we feel, but what we say that makes us different and that makes us distinctive. And this is what separates Caleb from the other spies. It's what he said that made it different. And we're not talking about just positive confession here because people who don't know Jesus and their lives are not based on the word of God, they can say positive things. They can go on a positive thinking course. And we're not talking about positive thinking or just the things that we say that, that can have a positive twist on them. But it's what we say spiritually. We are echoing what God has already said. And so what we say is based on what he has already said. It's not based on a good idea. It's not based on any of those other things but it's based on what he has said. So in our confession, in what we say, we are including God in what we say, because we can't say these things apart from our faith in him, because our faith is rooted in him. What we say is an echo of what he has already said. So we are including him in. Now you may recall last week we, we looked at a Hebrew word emet and it was one of our words which meant truth. And do you remember that we <clears throat> we took out the, the first Hebrew letter which was the 
Aleph. And we said that Jesus is the Aleph and the Tav. He's the beginning and the end. And that when you take Jesus out of the Emet, okay, when you take Jesus out of the truth, you just get the word Met. Uh, because you've taken the Aleph away. And met means death or dead. Okay, if you listened last week, you will remember that. Now, this week, uh, we're looking at men, aren't we, who've gone in and they've, they've made a, um, a declaration about the land. So this is the word man in Hebrew. Okay, so you've got ish, I-Y-S-H, that means man. And that's the word in Hebrew. It's the Aleph, it's a Yud, all right, the Y, and it's the Sh, it's the Shin. So that's ish, okay? And I just want to show you something else, that when you take out... The, the little jot, the little yud, you get the aleph, and I'll show you this in a moment, okay? So before we had the aleph, the yud, which means hand, and I've crossed that out. So that's the aleph, that's the yud, and that's the shin. You take the Yud away and you come to the Aleph and the Shin. Now the Yud is part of God's name. God's name is Yud Hey Vav Hey, which is where we would get our Yehovah from. I'm not going to write that out because it might get a bit too complicated. But just trust me that this little word Yud is the first letter of God's name, yud hey vav hey. Now, when you take out a part of God's name and a part of who he is from the word man, from Ish, when man takes God out of the word, like last week, we get the Aleph and the Shin, because we haven't got the Yud, it's been taken out. And the Aleph and the Shin together equal the word fire. Okay, it's the word Esh. So Ish becomes Esh when we take part of God's name out of the word and it goes from man and now it means fire so like death was a very very negative experience as opposed to truth so fire speaks about destruction does it not and we know do we not that everyone who was counted in the census in Numbers chapter 1, of the age of 20 years and over, they were all counted in the, in the census. They all perished in the desert, in the wilderness wanderings. And fire speaks about perishing. Fire speaks about destruction. And so it's really important that we overcome and Caleb and Joshua overcame by what they said. And this is really important in your life and my life because there are times, uh, and I didn't particularly experience that, but a lot of people have, when people have said things over you or about you in your life, and, and they've come across as, as a sort of a curse, 
really. And they haven't been good. They haven't been healthy. And you might have carried those things for years and years and years. And uh, there was a lady in a church I went to years and years ago. And um, I asked her to sing in, in church. And we were doing like a workshop type of situation. And oh, she said, oh, I, I can't, I can't really sing. Uh, I can't sing. Uh, and I said, well, well, why is that? And she looked at her husband and uh, she said to him, well, shall we tell him? So she obviously had a story to tell. And so she said when she was uh, having singing lessons, she was only about six or seven. Uh, her teacher said to her, you will never sing. Uh, you haven't got a very good voice, so you might as well give up singing. And she carried those words in her heart and in her mind for over 50 years. And that night I, I, I prayed for her and I, I just came against all that negative uh, conversation and words over her. And for the first time in 50 years, she sang in public. And I think she sang something like um, Faithful One, So Unchanging, something like that. But you see, the words that we say to each other have a really powerful effect. And words that have been said to us and over us over the years can have a really, really powerful effect. That's why we need to be cancelling out those negative things and speaking positively not based on positive thinking or the positive books that we can buy, but based on the word of God, based on what God has already said, that he has promised this inheritance for you and for me. And that's what this is all about, isn't it? Your inheritance and my inheritance and what we are enjoying or supposed to be enjoying in our walk with Jesus. And so in our conquering, if you like, uh, in our term of we can certainly do it, there is a sense of overcoming, but also remember the other meaning of the word, the word to suffer, overcoming and suffering. And Jesus said in, uh, well, it, it says in Acts 14, 12, uh, actually, so that's Luke, it says uh, through much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom of God. Through much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom of God. Now, entering the kingdom of God is a lovely concept. It's a lovely thought, isn't it? But it's through much tribulation we must enter the kingdom of God. So you can't have the second bit without the first bit. You can't have the the blessing and the power of Pentecost without the cross. One comes before the other. And so overcoming and suffering are not contradictory. They are complementary. And if we're not willing to embrace suffering, then I very much doubt whether we will ever embrace being an overcomer. We want one, but we don't want the other. And that's certainly not what I see in the Bible. It's not what I see in the life of Jesus. It's not what we see in the life of the apostles. It's not what we see in the lives of the early church. And it's not what we see in the lives of many missionaries and people of God who God has raised up over the years to serve him. There has been suffering in their ministry. But they have known the blessing and the power of God. And really, I've just had my <laughs> half an hour. I'm trying to keep them to half an hour, uh, as you know. Um, I want to finish, really, with, with a saying. Teddy Roosevelt in 1910, he had been the US president. And he gave uh, probably one of the most uh, important and um famous speeches and this is part of the speech that he gave 
and it's called The Man in the Arena. And you listen to this and you can find it online for yourself. And it says, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions? Who spends himself in a worthy cause? Who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement? And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly? so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. And I might have said this before, but you know, a lot of Christians, they play safe. They don't risk. Uh, they don't want to step out into the deeper water and all those pictures that we can think about. They don't want to go up the mountain in order to go down in the valley to experience the fruit. And really, as we come to the conclusion of our studies in Numbers 13, there's, there's a choice that you need to make, and, and it's a change of mind, it's a change of heart. You can either be someone on the sidelines who's cheering all the others in the arena, or you can get in the, the arena yourself. Because the blessing of being in the arena far outweighs the, I can't even call it the blessing really, but the experience of standing on the sidelines and simply cheering. So the Lord bless you. I hope you found these studies in Numbers um, 13 inspiring and helpful. Uh, as usual, if you'd like to contact me, you can contact me through the New Barn CF website. Uh, my number is 07906 270903. So I'm very happy for you to contact me and to chat with me about anything that I have shared. And uh, remember that if you are a publisher or you know a book publisher, <laughs> then let me know. Uh, because I would love to be able to turn some of these teachings uh, into a book. So just before I close, I want to pray a prayer. Um, so let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the experience, Lord, of Joshua and Caleb. Lord, for their inspiration to us and how they spoke, Lord, something of what they saw. Bless you, Lord, for their willingness to be different. And we pray, Lord, that we might look at their lives and, Lord, we might really take it on board, Lord, who they were and what they did and how they acted. Lord, we want to be people who are significant. We want to be people who make a difference in our lives and in the lives of other people. Lord Jesus, will you use us and touch us, Lord, and help us, Lord, to really begin perhaps for the first time ever, to enjoy the fruit of our inheritance, which you've promised us in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for any who don't know you as their personal saviour, that they would know to make that first step would be, be the most wonderful decision and choice that they could ever make. So we bless you for your goodness, for your faithfulness to us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you and I'll see you uh, next week. Uh, next week is Pentecost uh, or Shavuot. 
so I'll be looking at something of the Feast of Shavuot. Okay, God bless you, and goodbye.